theory for uh, mechanical dissection. It's a very procedural theory. It was last the time of the distinguished panels, members, who are here despite their busy schedule. As you know, we have a bipartisan agreement on the budgets. No continuing resolution. Budgets are all set, and you don't have to defend anything. <laughs> So, having said that, you know, you understand that uh, uh, presenting and uh, competing for the science programs, for the strategies and the plans are something that uh, is very important. And uh, I would like to again to thank the speakers for taking part in the business schedule down here. Uh, so, what we are going to do this morning is to look at the United States space for the next 20 years. Uh, you all have heard that uh, shuttle is not flying. Uh, you heard that we don't have access to space. And uh, they are the, the, the working half of it. And uh, uh, you all are relating to the programs that, uh, that uh, we have in space through the lens of uh, human space flight sometimes, because that's what the news uh, talk most about it. But, uh, the uh, U.S. is uh, really in a transition phase, and the U.S. science has been the stalwart of uh, the whole space exploration. So today we will explore basically the science policies and, uh, for NASA and what it means for all of us. And nobody is not going to talk about the plan and the Tesla, but uh, we should remember that the contribution of uh, NASA to, uh, to uh, the world health was more than just planning on the We have written textbooks. We understand the world we live in. We start to look back at Earth and uh, in medicine and physician. Basically, my name is all the professors and physician. I have an MD after my name. Basically, what uh, always uh, fascinated me that we have changed the way we practice medicine through technology and through the pressures of providing care at this <coughs> So NASA is more than just uh, the little uh, gadgets that people go around and talk about. NASA is basically about knowledge and about changing the way, uh, understanding our place in the group. So let's look quickly what we are going to talk about. Uh, if you look at the handouts that I gave you, or those of you who have, you will find that NASA space policy and NASA strategy remain quite constant. Landing on the moon or not landing on the moon, and having the space station, not having the space station, and having international cooperation or lack of their role for competition has been very constant. And though each administration has changed slightly the vision of NASA, the main tenets, the core, is still to uh, reveal the universe, to understand our place in the universe further on, where we are going to worry about all the comments and all the things which might leave us, and also bring things back when we think of human rights. We did not get manufactured money in space, but we spent it on Earth. Okay? So that's the first question. Uh, NASA science is from space. We will really understand. What is our plan, our place for you? We can predict disasters, we'll worry about that later on. It's also about space. You see those auto telescope and, uh, and uh, web telescope, uh, fantastic pictures about space and galaxies and uh, our Milky Way. And we start, we have, you know, if you look at what the NSF tells now to our students in high school, what at each grade, they should know about the universe is spectacular. I was very far to do that, but I mentioned, you know, we were, we were told to learn about solar night charts, and then, uh, um, you know, believe that Galileo was burned. No, it was not burned. It was, uh, that was Jordan Bruno. But anyhow, we were told to those things. We were not told, uh, talked about if there are other planets out there, if there is life out there. There was no astrobiology institute. And uh, in space, that's what we'll be talking about, is that while we are going to use and commercialize space, to do research in space, 
what are the attributes of space that we are searching for from the atmosphere. So we are looking today, we will not know our body for the next 20 years. Get it ready for the next job for the humans and for the robotic exploration. Uh, obviously, the humans in our lifetime or beyond our lifetime, in the near future, we will not go beyond the solar system. But robotic missions might. Voyager is flying out there, uh, approaching the stellar, or uh, passing it into the stellar space. And uh, uh, currently, we will be talking about, uh, not the latter, we will be talking about the new Mars uh, science mission that we just launched last month. And it's uh, spectacular, exciting, and uh, very inspiring. Uh, our home planet Earth, we learned a lot. If you think about the debate, we are worried about climate change. Forget about global warming. About uh, climate change, you will find out that a lot is there to be known. A lot is there to be predicted. A lot of there is to be modeled, understood, and applied to the practical side of uh, benefiting us living on this planet. Actually, you know, which uh, things which really fascinates me is that looking back at Earth from space, we developed a new dimension of the epidemiology, which is about disease spread and uh, environment and habitability. And then we go to space because the attributes of gravity and reduced gravity are things that we can understand by going to space. You know, did you ever think about it? That we are born on Earth, we live on Earth, we live on the gravity, yet we gain force. One part of our life that we lose force again. Why is that? Why gravity plays one way and then it plays against us? We don't know. But there are certain attributes, which is microgravity or low gravity, that cannot be reproduced on the lower level. There's a thing, but long term uh, microgravity cannot be produced. And one microgravity, because if you look at Earth and space, these are canvas. In space, there is no convection. We don't distribute the heat. And if you look at the candle, the way it burns in space and the way it burns on Earth, you can see on Earth you have soot because of the gravity and the things working. So on Earth, uh, in space, it's not that way. It's evenly distributed. Excuse me. I just put time down. Buoyancy does not ex exist goes away when you go to space. Fluids and fluids and uh, the different fluids or different density do not mix together. We don't layer the same way as the layer of an earth. And sedimentation, which is dropping things, does not happen in space the way it happens on earth. So those are attributes which can help, which can help us model what gravity does to us. And that's one of the major attributes that we have. So we have to give the whole. And then commercial space, uh, from the beginning to the total commercial it's the commercial space. And uh, uh, you know, Virgin Galactic selected uh, the new astronaut, who will also be the great astronaut. But then uh, uh, there is a competition going on, tremendous competition for access to space. Both for the satellites, the remote sensing, communication satellites, and those are provided through commercial trees. And our competitiveness depends on that because there are about 70 entities, nationally international, at least, Francesca is going to correct me, which are competing for that. And if you look at it, the FAA and the uh, Department of Transportation are responsible for commercial launches besides the military and NASA, but in 2000, can we drop it? So if the competition is fixed and we need to understand why and how it's going to happen and why this administration is fostering also commercialization. So without any further ado, I would like uh, to call uh, our uh, um, <coughs> Massachusetts scientist who is here, Dr. Maria Dardelati, and uh, he's a professor at the University of Colorado. He's, uh, um, He's uh, interested in uh, earth sciences, specifically ice. And uh, you know, one thing which fascinates me about him, because I was not there, and he was, he wrote about that. That's a very hard environment.
physics on Earth help us understand how life works, how it functions. So we have a number of science achievements, and, and it, it would delight me to give you a, a list of a hundred or so of them, uh, but eventually I would lose you. So I'm trying to I'll summarize it in kind of a big picture sense. Um, last year, Science Magazine's top ten insights of the last decade included four that were directly related to NASA. These include precision cosmology, where we came from, how the universe uh, evolved, water on Mars, active water on Mars, uh, exoplanets, the potential for Earth-like planets far out in space, and significant advances in climate change <coughs> And we're at a point now, actually, where we, we, recently we, we've had a great year, a uh, great few years. Uh, I say that as a scientist. Obviously, I, I um, you know, I am nostalgic for the shuttle program, although I look forward to what comes next. Um, but from a science standpoint, we're going strong. Um, and I'm going to take you through a few of these and some of the, the incredible achievements. Starting with Earth science, we now have the ability to observe from space um, ocean salinity, which is directly related to weather, directly related to climate. Yeah, that the ocean circulation holds the key to present and future climate. And this figure, I, I should have brought the other. There's another I have with 125 years of ship-based measurements. Okay. Does not fill this in even two-thirds of the way. Maybe half. Southern hemisphere is just totally empty. This is two weeks from the Aquarius mission. So week after week after week, we're able to not just detect the salinity of the surface, okay, we have to give a little. Ships can go deeper and collect uh, deeper values. But not just to detect salinity of the surface <laughs> on global scales, but also how that's changing. Okay? And you can, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but you can see the freshwater discharge of the Mississippi River. You can see um, equatorial upwelling. The deeper fresh water comes up due to the characteristics of the winds and the divergence of the air flow. There's a tremendous amount of information in this picture. And we ratchet it up a level when we watch how this picture changes. Uh, in August, we launched the Juno mission to Jupiter. It's en route to Jupiter. It will orbit the gas giant. I don't know how many people know, but Jupiter holds more mass than everything else in the solar system, except the sun combined. Um, so it will orbit Jupiter, and then in a grand finale, go flying into the gas until it can fly no more, crashes into some core at the center, what we'll, we'll learn as we go. Um, the GRAIL mission, looking at the gravity and interior structure of the moon. How did it evolve? What's it made of? What, what does that tell us about our own planet? Um, the NPP, uh, Next Generation Weather Satellite and Climate. There's a lot of controversy over that, but it does make measurements that help us understand the climate and understand the weather. Um, the Mars Science Laboratory, the rover Curiosity. This is a remarkable uh, instrument. It's about the size of a small car. And I had the privilege and pleasure of watching it launch uh, the two days after Thanksgiving, just last week. Um, it's en route to Mars. It will get there in about eight and a half months and uh, deploy it and roll on the surface. It's got a number. I think it's, it's either nine or ten. I think it's nine sensors. Um, to understand the chemical makeup, to assess the suitability for life. Could, it's not looking for life, it's looking for conditions that suggest life could have or may exist on the surface of Mars. It's part of the evolution of understanding the Mars rover. I think the, uh, sorry, the Martian characteristics. So this is an animation. As, as it enters the Martian atmosphere, the parachute deploys it stops. It stops right in the atmosphere. I'm not sure when. Then it starts again. <laughs> this is good. Actually, it's good. It lets you see the rover. The rover comes out of the shell with the sky crane. The sky crane fires four rockets, lowers the rover, separates, and flies off into space. It's uh, or flies off elsewhere on the Martian surface. Um, it rolls along. 
it, it looks better than that, but it actually gets there, I think. Oh, this is good. This is the kind of images we'll get back. It drills into the surface. It collects samples from the surface. It will put them into a, a into an analyzer um, to look at the spectral characteristics and determine the makeup. It also has, in fact, I'm going to go back one. Um, aside from a camera, it's got a laser. Well, it will identify sites of interest, sites that look like they have interesting chemical makeup, to determine whether it should scoop up or drill and collect material from there and um, analyze it for its makeup or content or to fire a laser at it. Okay? A laser comes out of about here, uh, fires a laser to vaporize it, and look at the material in the gaseous state. It's a very sophisticated instrument. It's, it's preceded, it's been preceded by the Pathfinder and then Spirit and Opportunity Road, which you may have heard of. And the analogy is uh, if Pathfinder were a middle school student, Spirit and Opportunity would be the graduate student, and this would be the professor. Um, so I don't know what that was. We'll set a real professor next. So maybe that'll be me. Um, we have a number of near-term milestones for our missions. Uh, you saw the Braille mission that should uh, insert into the lunar orbit December 31st. The New Star launch, this is a high-energy X-ray astronomy mission, uh, launching in March 2012. Dawn is a mission orbiting um, the asteroid Vesta and the dwarf planet Ceres. Right now it's around Vesta and it will depart and head towards Ceres to look at, um, by, by looking at these sort of pure elements uh, elsewhere in the solar system, we get some indication of the history, the impact history primarily from the geometry, um, but also to learn about the stuff in the solar system, what it can tell us about our own planet. Radiation about storm probe, this is a, a heliophysics or solar mission. We get to Mars in August, and it's funny, this is my oldest daughter's birthday, and we arrive on my youngest daughter's birthday. Um, I'm going to miss her birthday, actually. Uh, and then heliophysics missions, and uh, Landsat Data Continuity, Orbiting Carbon Observatory, and a lunar uh, dust mission. So we've got a lot of things coming up. We've done a lot of things recently. And I show this because the comment was made about the end of the shuttle program. Um, that is the end of a program. It is not the end of NASA. It is certainly not the end of uh, space exploration. There's a very robust set of science missions and activities going on in Earth science, heliophysics, planetary science, astrophysics. And you'll hear from Mark about the National Lab, which is a whole other dimension of exciting research that will be ongoing. So we're, um, we're in good shape uh, as we evolve to the next generation of, of human capabilities. Um, in human exploration, we have uh, upcoming research. We have solicitations. Some of them are on the street. Some of them are upcoming, looking at space radio biology. Uh, technology developments for, for, to support crew health and safety. How can we keep people safer? And we'll hear from Rich about some of the challenges associated with that. Um, understanding basic physics. By removing the dominant variable on Earth, gravity, uh, we can look at physics. I love that candle image that, that we showed, the flame image that we showed earlier. You, know, you just think about it, you picture a flame that billows upward. We don't usually think about it. Uh, emitting its energy uniformly in all the directions. Um, little things like that, tremendous clues in basic physics in there. Opportunities in space biology. How does life work? How does it work in space? What does that tell us about how it works on Earth? Uh, in the midterm, these are more um, planetary uh, kinds of missions. Um, we have selected, uh, these will be down selected, but we have selected three missions. Um, one is a comet hopper, it's going to land 12 times in different locations in, uh, on a, a comet, sample um, its makeup in different locations. Geophysical monitoring station, landing on the surface of Mars, and basically exploring things and listening to the propagation characteristics. 
Um, I love this, the Titan Mar Explorer. So Saturn has a moon, Titan. Titan has methane lakes and rivers on it. And this proposal that is currently under study is to land a boat in one of those lakes for 45 days and sail. Well, I guess it won't be wind power to float. Um, and send back data. The orientation of Titan with Earth is such that for 45 days it should be able to send the data back to us. Um, I don't want to get too much into that. Oh, this is the next uh, sort of a larger mission. This is Osiris Rex to examine an asteroid. This will fly to an asteroid, come awfully close to it, extract from the surface of the asteroid, pack it up. This plays much more Mars, I guess, is more complicated. Bring it home and fire it right back at us. Um, hopefully with enough accuracy that we can retrieve it. Uh, otherwise, it will be a lot of lost money. But um, to understand other aspects of the solar system. So there are a number of activities, and, and I started this with um, science to inspire and science to serve. And when I think about NASA science, I, I think it's incredible on so many points. It's truly inspirational. You know, what kid? Does not look up at the stars and wonder. You know, when I showed the image of the nebula at the beginning, you know, it's in us. When we're kids, we wonder, what's it like out there? Or out there, I guess, is more appropriate. Is there life there? Could I ever go there? If I did, what would it be like? Well, these kinds of things. And we're literally going out and, and reaching into the heavens. Uh, the very distant galaxies we're not touching, but our neighbors, the elements that components of the solar system, we're actually reaching out and touching, bringing people to this stuff home. Um, looking to the longer term, where are we going? Well, I, I want to be very clear. Uh, these, uh, I'm not saying these are missions, well, this has a very good chance of happening, but these, these are missions we have our eye on. I don't want you to walk away and say, oh, I saw a talk and our sample return is going to happen. We're aiming for this, we're working toward this, where we actually land on the surface, collect the sample, cache it, and at some point in the future, go grab it, fire it up into space, and have it rendezvous with either a crewed, um, crewed capability, crewed, C-R-E-W-E-D capability, supposed to, um, <laughs> or a robotic capability and return the sample back to Earth. W first. Okay, so we have the Hubble Space Telescope, which you're all familiar with. Next up is the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay, looking farther into the universe, about 50 to 100 times farther than Hubble. W first, even beyond that. And really getting right to the edge of the universe as we understand it. Really looking to the earliest activities or elements of our galaxy. Uh, I'm sorry, I've argued. Call our universe. Uh, that's probably conceded to the universe. <laughs> um, so the probe plus to understand the sun, its its variability, and I think a lot of people don't realize how tied we are to the sun. It's the obvious photosynthesis, keeping warm, energy for the planet, but also as we become a more and more electronic uh, nation, I have, I'll put it this way: I, I tell people, well, literally and figuratively, I'd be lost without my GPS. Well, my GPS depends on solar activity, you know, or is vulnerable to solar activity. So understanding that, looking at the Earth in new ways, many opportunities uh, and on our horizon. So how do we uh, figure out what we're going to do? It's not just some person in a room who was lucky enough to get the job of head of the science director, you know, decide what they want to do. Our first guidance comes from our founding document, the Space Act of 1958. And, and uh, that tells us, study the Earth from space. It tells us, study space. It tells us, try and grow into space. Reach out into the, into the space environment. Um, as part of the executive branch, we are directed by the National Space Policy of 2010, the President's Space Policy. Um, boy, what's missing from here? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped that, okay. 
Congress tells us what to do, and uh, they refresh that every few years. So we uh, we at NASA are big fans of obeying the law and not going to jail. So this is a very important one. Uh, it's the law of land, we do it. Uh, we have advisory committees, um, but for the content of our programs, we form what are called decadal surveys. Roughly every decade, we bring together, well, we ask the National Research Council to assemble an august body of scientists who then reaches out to the broad science community. So there may be 50, 60 people on the decadal uh, panel, but they then survey the entire science community. The last Earth Science one I was involved in, we solicited 2,900 scientists. You can imagine the ideas you get from asking 2,900 scientists what are the most important questions in Earth Science. So the astrophysics came out in 2010, planetary uh, <coughs> earlier this year. Heliophysics is in process. This is a new one, life and physical sciences. Um, really helping guide our investment uh, strategies in this area and earth science uh, in 2007. We rely heavily on these. These are the statements of the scientific community that tell us this is what's important and we suggest these ways of going about it. However, these do get filtered through a lens. And uh, these get filtered, in particular earth science, get filtered through a lens of administration priorities, um, but they all get filtered through a lens of potential for international partnerships, um, potential for advancing NASA's capability to achieve its missions, these kinds of things. But they are our guidance and we take them seriously. So our investment strategy, be responsive to the science community through their statements in the decade survey. Um, Select our missions through competitive peer review. Be responsive to national priorities. STEM, educating the next generation of scientists, scientists um, being responsible stewards of our planet, uh, other things. Um, these are all, this is more just business, how we do business. But generally, we don't read Earth science so we can go to Mars, or the James Webb Space Telescope. Well, that's a bad example. We, we try to avoid uh, sp spreading overruns in one area and spilling into others. We try to solve our problems within discipline. Um, actually, this is a little more technical. I'll, I'll speak to it if someone wants, but I'll skip to it. I'll skip it right now. Uh, we invest a lot in science enabling technology as well. Uh, robotic exploration of the Earth and solar system requires that we develop capabilities to make it happen. Okay. So we're looking at new remote sensing technologies. We're looking at um, lower cost and particularly lower mass um, capabilities or instrumentation because the launch costs are, are tremendous. Uh, Novel platforms. We do a lot of our astrophysics studying the, the far reaches of the universe from balloons. Blow a balloon over Antarctica for six months and accumulate data um, and other opportunities. Intelligent distributed systems, and it, this is basically making the most of what we've got. Developing new things, developing new ways to make the most of what we've got. Now, our investments in technology have a number of uh, payoffs outside of uh, space and scientific research. Um, and, and it's actually a good segue, I think, to what Mark is going to be covering because a lot of the stuff we do, whether it's for exploring planets or figuring out how to function and, and recycle water on the space station or something like that, has led to a number of things. Most people just think it's Velcro and tank, but it's actually. Uh, <laughs> Ultrasound measurements, uh, LED light therapy, clean energy. This is huge when you want to function in space. You, you don't want to be contaminating the limited environment within which you have to live. Uh, groundwater radiation. These are more, and this is broader NASA technology investments. This isn't just from a science perspective. Our aeronautics, uh, fuel saving um, wing designs, 
uh, long life batteries for cars. I love this aerogel insulation and of the basic physics of trying to absorb shock and impact for exploration purposes. Also work to benefit you when you go jogging. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't go into the rest of it. But the point is our investments in technology for science and exploration have payoffs or spin-offs in everyday life. There are a number of challenges. Getting to space is expensive. We're trying to figure out getting far into space is more expensive. We're trying to figure out how to do that. With the space station again here for Mark, we're trying to make the most of a limited resource. We have a limited amount of time on station. Currently, it's the light is being extended to 2020. We expect to go uh, beyond that. Um, but it is time limited. Um, actually, the demands for transmitting results, the bandwidth, basically, um, the need for enabling technology. We want, we got all kinds of ideas that we're just short of being able to do. So we invest a lot in technology, and the big one, the elephant in the room, budget constraints. Unlimited budget, we do all kinds of stuff. And in fact, with an roughly unlimited budget, we do all kinds of stuff. We set up, well, one kind of stuff. We set foot on the moon. Um, and this is the budget distribution uh, from the Apollo era up until now. And I show this because I, I don't want you to think so, well, I do want you to think about this. There was a time when we occupied about 6% of the national budget, a little less than 6% of the national budget. Today, we're one tenth of that fraction. But if you just take the area, if you take the area of the curve, the, the equivalent amount of dollars, what's happening here may only be about a quarter of the dollar amount of what's happening here. But the achievements have been phenomenal. And I go back to what I said. So we're starting to understand the origins of the universe, the fact that its expansion is accelerating rather than decelerating. <laughs> resulted in the Nobel Prize uh, in physics this year. Um, understanding our own planet, water on Mars, active water on Mars, not just remnants of water, but active water on Mars. Tremendous capabilities for that investment. So um, I'm going to skip that. I want to look to the future. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay? We need partnerships to be successful. Okay. And these partnerships allow us to do much more than we can on our own. And I, I, I go to James Webb because it's sort of symbolic of looking, actually, cell phone technology you can trace back to this. <laughs> I find that a compliment. Right? Um, looking far, looking beyond, reaching far, extending the human reach. And I have what I call, this is just about the last slide, the, the continuum of success. It starts with a dream. And with some thought, you start to think, hey, maybe I can do it. It becomes an aspiration. So you pursue it. Generally, you don't succeed. You iterate on the aspire, pursue, aspire, pursue, but eventually success. And I think if we look at NASA, this is what we do. Okay? We take dreams. And we turn them into successes. And we work this continuum in multiple stages of multiple areas. Um, and so I want to leave you with the thoughts. Uh, this is a quote. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And I think when it comes to space, we as a civilization have that longing. And that longing enables us to work together, enables us to focus, and enables us to do amazing things. And so uh, the psychonic symbol, the psychon is a symbol of those amazing things. We're at a point in human civilization where we can go from dreaming, we've dreamt for millennia, for thousands and thousands of years. We can go from dreaming to doing. We are doing that. If you think about humanity, human civilization, a little slice of time we're at now, we're at what, is sep what separates all that has gone before from all that lies ahead. And it's a privilege to be at this point in human history, quite frankly. And um, 
I want you to think about that. We have robust science activities. We have robust human exploration activities. And you're going to hear about some of that coming up. Um, and think about where we are. We're doing stuff that since the humans have first looked up to the stars, <coughs> so after they evolved and they hunched over and they looked up, they realized there's something else out there. Um, we're pursuing that. So I'm not sure how much time I have for questions, if any, but I wanted to leave you with that thought, and I think that will be fine to end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. time for two questions, and we reserve the rest of the questions for the end of the session. Okay. Two questions. Now you use both, are you? <laughs> <laughs> sure, so I saw that. Oh. Yeah, the the uh, that is tricky. Largely, the ICAR issues are generally workable. You can contain your piece; they contain their piece, and you deliver product together. I think the space station is the more of a challenge. And that's paved the way for all these other things. It's really more of a cycling of funding opportunities and establishment of priorities. So we get our decade of surveys, we say, okay, these are our priorities. We look for partners. And sometimes it works that the European Space Agency is ready. Sometimes they're ahead of us. Sometimes they're behind us. Sometimes it's JAXA. And so phasing turns out to be our biggest challenge. But over time, and largely with compelling personal relationships uh, and patience, we work it out. And NASA has a tremendous track record of international partnerships and domestic partnerships that really have enabled us to do things the other way. So we, we work it, but it's hard. Uh, exoplanets. Yes. We're getting an idea of their size, how far out they are from their, uh, their host of star. Uh, what are we looking at in the future on more resolution? I know we won't be seeing continents on or anything, but... No, it won't we'll be seeing continents. And, and it, it, I showed the W first uh, image. The way we, we look at exoplanets right now is largely than the, the occultation of you know, how much star light is eliminated by what passes in front of it. We hope with something like W first, um, wide field, infrared, something telescope, um, that we would actually be able to image the surface uh, at, at what resolution, you know, I don't know, but at least a pixel for the planet, mm -hmm. which is different than what we do now, which is try and measure the loss of light to the doctor equation. Um, if we can, can get a, a planet at pixel scale, you're right, we're not going to see continents, we're not going to see rivers and lakes and stuff. If we get a planet at pixel scale, we can at least then, with the right spectral properties, get some assessment of its, con of its content, oxygen rich, nitrogen rich, whatever. So the, the goal is to fit it in a pixel and then be able to retrieve spectral information. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, before we proceed any further, uh, I would like to offer a nice couple of people. Uh, Gail Allen here, who is the director of uh, strategic planning in the office of the chief scientist himself in uh, the presentation. And uh, I would like to recognize a very old friend of mine, very old uh, Mr. Richard Barnes, sitting here, used to be at NASA, he introduced me to international cooperation. Thank you for coming. Here. And, uh, uh, just to let you know that this session is co-sponsored by the American Astronautical Society and, uh, and uh, the executive director, the executive vice president of the society is here. Okay. And we have also Dr. Vince Michaud, who is working with the, uh, with the chief medical officer of NASA. He is his deputy, also is here. Um, the next person to be talking is Mark Brett. 
I uh, provided this bio, you know, says that it is a very interesting priest that he lives in Washington, his wife has a, a business, private commercial business, which is a bread and breakfast, right? We need to come and get that uh, one of these days, have a meeting there. But uh, I'm not back since the days of the space, the International Space Station. The International Space Station sponsored those programs, which is a very wonderful program. It survived about 10 administrations or six. 10, right? 10, thank you. And uh, Mark was always there. And uh, I uh, watched Mark uh, develop into his current position, which is the director of uh, International Space Station, which is actually has been declared as a national uh, facility uh, and uh, open to be used for all the U.S. government, etc. Like and, et and uh, Mark is uh, uh, has a, a master's in uh, in uh, public uh, in administration, business administration, and master of science. But uh, most of Mark was recognized as uh, the authority for international collaboration, cooperation, collaboration, and commercialization. He was recognized by presidential rank awards, and uh, Mark has done a lot to push forward the space station over those last 10 years. And uh, um, he deserves our kudos for his persistence and consistency in developing and supporting the science. Mark, please. Thank you, Arnold, uh, for the opportunity to speak this morning, and, and thank you all for uh, joining us here. A few words to begin about the International Space Station Program. It, it is quite possibly the largest international cooperative endeavor in science and technology that's ever been undertaken. It's a partnership between Canada, Europe, Russia, Japan, and the United States. We have bilateral memoranda of understanding with each of these nations, and we all work together under a intergovernmental agreement that was established in uh, 1980. The program uh, actually had its uh, inception in 1984 uh, in President Ronald Reagan's State of the Union address, uh, and then uh, it's now 27 years uh, since the inception of the program. The, uh, the our nation has invested some $60 billion uh, in building and operating the space station to date. Our partners have invested uh, something in excess of $10 billion. Uh, we don't audit their investments, uh, but we know the general magnitude. And we have just this past summer completed the assembly of the facility. Uh, so what I would like to do with you today is, is talk about two, two topics, really. Uh, what is the value of the facility and the promise that comes with using the space environment? It's an extraordinarily uh, unique environment from a phenomenological uh, perspective. And then a little bit about the about policy aspects that are, will really regulate the future and the productivity of the station in the future. Uh, I think it's important at the onset that we recognize that a program of this magnitude has both intangible and tangible types of benefits. The intangible benefits are pretty well understood. Uh, it's an incredible program for stimulating science, technology, engineering, and math education in young people. And we have a very vibrant educational program to pull uh, kids from kindergarten through graduate programs into the uh, space program and, and get them familiar with operating in the space environment. It's also a symbol of global leadership for the United States. The U.S. has about a 75% share in this endeavor, and we are the integrator of the program. Uh, and as such, it becomes a great symbol for, for U.S. Pro prowess, not just in the technology, but in being able to work cooperatively uh, with nations around the world. Uh, and then finally, it has tremendous uh, capability for advancing science and technology and serving as a diplomatic vehicle uh, in our science and technology interactions with these other countries. Uh, so those, those are the intangible benefits that are very well known. But what are not as well known, mostly because the space station has been under assembly for the past decade, are what the tangible benefits are. And that's what I'd like to be able to uh, review with you here today. 
Why do we go into space in the first place? We send both robots and humans into space. They each have different capabilities. The humans are necessary because most of the experimental research that we do in the human space program is similar to benchtop laboratory research on the ground where you want to be able to iterate the experiment results in the course of doing the experiment, adjust your parameters, repeat the experiments. You can do that to a limited degree remotely through teleoperation, but there's nothing yet that replaces the human being being directly in the loop in the course of conducting the experiment. These are not observational studies, these are highly interactive experiments. The robots, on the other hand, are proving extremely valuable in terms of doing some of the repetitive operations, particularly those related to assembly of the station and maintaining the spacecraft. We don't have to put our crews at risk in extravehicular activities if we can apply robots to those same activities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're advancing technologies in both of those uh, areas. We have an extraordinarily promising outcomes. And, and this is the part of the program that I don't believe is, is widely known at this point because we've been so focused on the construction and the assembly for so many years. But I'm going to review a couple of very specific, high value uh, space technology applications that are already in the course of being demonstrated, as well as some microgravity science applications with specific scientific results. And then, of course, not leave out the potential that we have for basic research in areas like high energy physics. So just stepping through a few of these examples, uh, while we mentioned uh, the regenerative environmental control system that we have on board the space station, you have to keep in mind that when you're operating in a low Earth orbit environment, you have no alternative but to be able to recycle to the maximum degree possible both your air and your water. And we have a, uh, not a totally closed loop system, but about 85% closed loop for water in our uh, regenerative environmental control life support system on the space station. Uh, this was achieved only recently. The most recent element was deployed what's called the Sabatier uh, reactor on the station. The Sabatier process takes waste carbon dioxide and hydrogen and converts it to methane and water so that we can recover that water and, and reuse it on the space station. The system is now up and running. It has been for about a year. The nature of these kinds of developments are that you have a, a shakedown period of one to two years as you try to optimize these systems and get them running regularly and be able to service them so that they have a high uh, reliability and, and they're available to you all the time. Uh, and this system is proven to do that. In many respects, the space station is possibly one of the most advanced environmental recycling systems know because it has to be a low bit uh, You probably are aware that we use solar photovoltaic arrays for power generation on the station. We produce about 160 kilowatts of power. And again, our systems have to be extraordinarily energy efficient uh, because we're at such a remote distance and, and we need to operate at the lowest possible power. So the space station, a little known to many people, is probably the most advanced machine ever built in terms of environmental recycling and energy efficiency. Robotic servicing is a technology that we have long aspired to, but had very little opportunity to really press the limits on. In partnership with uh, Canada, McDonnell Detweiler and Associates have built the, uh, all of, virtually all of the external robotics that are on the space station. We have a large robot arm that uh, is similar to the robot arm on the space shuttle, which was also built by Canada, that is on a platform that moves back and forth on the truss and allows us to service different elements of the space station. At the end of that long arm, the Canadians have also <coughs> built what's called uh, a special purpose dexterous manipulator. This is quite a large structure. These arms are on the order of 15 feet in length. And they have the dexterity that allows the robot, under ground control from Canada, 
to actually be able to change out circuit breakers on the outside of the space station and save us the extravehicular crew activity time. Now, now, why is this really significant? What's the payoff? NASA's mission is in both exploration and development. And if you look throughout the course of history, exploration has always been coupled with development. Typically, the public sector finances the exploration, and the private sector finances the development, and the bridge between those two is the gray area, the difficult area to transverse, or, or what is sometimes called the, uh, the Gulf of Death, trying to get it from basic research into applications. What we've done here with McDonnell Detweiler is uh, in early in 2012, we'll be doing a demonstration of this robot to show that it can transfer fuel from a container to a satellite. A fuel transfer demonstration. Why is that important? We have over a $70 billion a year industry just in the United States in communication satellites and military satellites. All of those satellites have a propellant supply on board in order to station keep the satellite in its desired orbit at its desired orientation. The lifetime of that satellite is determined by the propellant that it has on board. We become very good at manufacturing satellites over the past 25 years, and typically their lifetimes go far beyond the actual design specifications. However, the propellant runs out. These are very expensive assets, several hundred million dollars a satellite, depending upon the application. If you can robotically refuel these satellites, you can extend, perhaps double, their lifetime. And we are right on the cusp of being able to demonstrate that that technology is ready. And in the next 10 years, I think you'll see a robotic satellite servicing industry evolve uh, competitively that will allow us to extend the life of satellites on board through the demonstrations that are being conducted on the space station today. What's that? Which part? Well, uh, yeah, that's a that looks like a reflection, spectral reflection on the big other things. Okay. <laughs> He's a dust problem. Uh, the other the other thing that we do in the area of technology is we're always advancing the materials that we use in our satellites. Well, the space environment is a very uh, aggressive environment. Atomic oxygen erosion occurs, uh, temperature cycling is very severe, and what we do on the space station is we uh, have a, a program called Materials on ISS Experiments. We've flown a series of eight of these test beds today and there's a consortium of American industry and American universities that will fly test specimens on this platform and use it to evaluate the degradation of these test specimens and select the next generation materials that will go into satellites. Now this program has evolved to not only include passive exposure of materials, but we're now planning to deploy devices on this platform, very high speed and large scale integrated service, in order to understand the transient upset phenomena uh, that occur in these radiation environments. This simple passive experiment is probably one of the most effective tools we have today that's developing the next generation of spacecraft systems. I want to switch over to the sciences for a minute, and I'll, I'll start uh, on the inorganic side of the spectrum. Uh, the phenomenological nature of microgravity, I think the best way to explain it, is if you think back to the end of the 19th century, uh, right around 1870 to 1890, we were just beginning to understand what a vacuum was, how to form a vacuum, a uh, deep vacuum, how to maintain that vacuum, how to measure its characteristics, and there were a few crazy scientists around at the time that actually thought vacuum might have some value. Well, most of the community scoffed at it. How can vacuum have a value? It's nothing. How can nothing have a value? But we saw nothing less than an industrial revolution in the 20th century in microelectronic devices. And that industrial revolution was enabled by vacuum processing because you're working at such a small scale 
that any contamination could destroy the product. And it was vacuum processing that really allowed us to move into the microelectronics age where we are today. Well, vacuum is the absence of matter. What we see in space is the absence of gravity, which is a force, one of the four fundamental forces of nature. If we can capitalize on the absence of force, then there's no reason that we can't also pursue some crazy scientific ideas about how to apply the absence of force in systems. And those are the examples I'm going to provide here to you today. This one in particular uh, involves production of metallic glasses. So let me first explain what a metallic glass is. It has nothing to do with the glass in your, in your window pane. Uh, a glass structure is nothing more than an amorphous structure where when the material goes from a melt to a solid, it solidifies in a random structure, as opposed to solidifying in a crystalline structure. In a crystalline structure, you can actually see the atoms all aligned in this structure. But in the amorphous structure, they're evenly distributed and it's random. The reason this is important to us is because the amorphous structure has different properties than the crystalline structure. So working with a team from uh, Caltech uh, in the uh, late 90s, uh, they deployed a series of experiments on the space shuttle that were looking to measure the thermal physical properties of complex alloys. The reason you can't do this on the ground is when you melt this complex alloy material in a container and then go to re-solidify the alloy, the walls of the container form nucleation sites and contaminate the measurements of the thermophysical properties. You have to be able to melt the material suspended in free space so that that contamination is absent, and then you can get an accurate measurement of the thermophysical properties, which is exactly what the Caltech scientists did on the space shuttle employing an electromagnetic levitator. As a result of that research, they were able to determine the thermophysical properties of this particular material it's a uh, complex zirconium-based alloy. And then they were able to reproduce the process on the ground in bulk quantity. We don't manufacture alloys in space. It's too costly to haul the material up and down. But if we can gain the knowledge about the thermal physical properties, we can then manufacture the material on the ground. And, and that's what this particular company uh, they're called Liquid Metals Corporation. You can Google them and, and read their red websites. They've actually produced a uh, liquid metal alloy that is double the yield strength of titanium. More than double the elasticity of titanium and stainless steel. And this is an incredible material. It allows you to actually, it has a relatively low melting point. So it's not the kind of material you're going to use in turbine blades or high temperature applications. But what it allows you to do is extrude the material in very complex geometries and make a very complicated high strength structure. We're using it uh, uh, in certain components in our Mars Science Laboratory. Last year, the company, Liquid Metals Technology, sold exclusive patent rights for worldwide application to Apple Computer uh, for application of microelectronic devices. That gives you some indication of the value of this liquid metal alloy. I'm going to turn to some of the biological examples and begin with uh, an experiment. This is one of many experiments that began in the mid-1980s involving bioreactors in space. And what these bioreactors do is they allow you to culture uh, cells, human, animal cells, in orbit under microgravity conditions. And what we find, here's a space example on the ground, uh, on the bottom, and the ground example up top. It's a little bit difficult to distinguish, but on the ground, in the bioreactor, you see a relatively even, hazy dispersion of these cells. And it's fairly uniform across the entire body. But what you see in space is those cells begin to aggregate. And as those cells aggregate, they're forming human tissue. In this case, it was a prostate cancer tissue that was being experimented on. Uh, but the point here 
is that you can take two human cells in space and allow them enough stability in three dimensions that they can start bridging between the cells and actually forming tissue. And this can't be done on the ground under any circumstances. These bioreactors are effective, more effective than using flasks and uh, petri dishes on the ground. Uh, a petri dish you know, is limited to two dimensions. But you have to have three-dimensional uh, matrix form, and you have to have uh, sufficient nutrients in the solution to allow them to grow. Uh, but we'll be uh, recapitalizing this program shortly so that we can renew it on the space station. Another area that uh, is pretty widely known is at the molecular level. Uh, large macromolecules, typically proteins, polysaccharides, nucleic acids, what we find is that a major portion of those, not all of them, but many of them, can be formed in space in a way that produces very uniform and very large crystals. And this is an example of a crystal of HPGDS, which is a protein that is involved in uh, the chain of events that leads to the advanced muscular dystrophy. This experiment was done by our Japanese colleagues on a Russian segment of the space station. And you can see the dramatic difference between a crystal that was produced on the ground and the crystal that our Japanese colleagues produced in space. Uh, they took this crystal to their Spring 8 uh, collider facility outside of Tokyo. Uh, they were able to, through neutron uh, scattering, determine the structure of the protein. Once they knew the structure of the protein, they designed a drug to interdict the protein, and they have demonstrated the ability to slow the progression of muscular dystrophy in canine specimens. And I'm going over to Japan next week to find out what the latest uh, stage is in this research. Last time I talked with them, they were moving to license uh, the new drug and distribute it commercially. Gene expression is radically different on an order than it is on the ground. Uh, anytime you stress uh, the genetic code, you get some deviations from normal gene expression. Radiation environments give you deviations, but the space environment gives you dramatic deviations. And, and that's what this uh, data attempts to illustrate. Uh, on the view right here, you see differential gene expression in a bioreactor, a rotating wall vessel, on the ground. And anything uh, that is beyond the second line, what the, what the PI is, principal investigator is looking for here is not just a random example of where a gene expressed differently, but repetition, at least three occurrences of that gene expressing differently in order to be confident that it's a result of the microgravity environment. And you see very few deviations re really beyond those, uh, those two lines. However, you take the same sample into space with the same nutrient composition, and you see massive deviation in the gene expression. The genes are the fundamental code for how our physiological system operates. Here's a specific application of that differential gene expression. Uh, this is a case of a, a principal investigator at Arizona State University um, and what you're seeing is the differential gene expression is causing a coating to develop on the salmonella uh, cells. What that coating does is it, it strengthens the cell and makes the salmonella more virulent in space, more dangerous, more pathogenic. If we can understand what specifically which genes are causing that external matrix to develop, and we can knock out those genes, then we have the potential to develop a vaccine against this particular pathogen. And that's a line of research that's being pursued both by universities and by private firms under space act agreements with NASA uh, in area with uh, pathogens like salmonella, um, streptococcus, uh, and methicillin resistant staph. And then finally, in the area of fundamental research, uh, we've been working with Professor Sam Ting at MIT, uh, who has developed what is uh, 
called an alpha magnetic spectrometer. It's a very large scale uh, electromagnetic particle detector. And what Dr. Ting is looking to do is to identify the presence of antimatter or dark matter in the near universe. I'm sure you're uh, probably familiar with the recent announcements out of Europe of the possibility of uh, having demonstrated neutrinos moving faster than the speed of light. Fundamental change in our entire understanding of high energy physics of particles. Uh, Dr. Ting looks to make similar observations. <coughs> observations which will change our fundamental understanding of the nature of matter and energy in the universe. This is looking at charged uh, galactic rays in order to determine what the composition of those galactic rays are. Now this is normally where I end this presentation when I'm talking to audiences in science and technology. When you have such a radical change as the absence of gravitational force, the applications of the fundamental science that can be pursued are really entirely up to the imagination of the innovator. But we're here today talking about policy. And that statement is not really an accurate statement. Use of space is not limited just to the imagination of the innovator. It's also limited by public policy. And what do we mean by public policy? It's not what's contained in speeches and, and oratorical <coughs> comments. Public policy is really codified in budgets. Either budgets proposed by the president annually, or authorization and appropriation acts that are passed by the Congress. In addition, this policy codified in White House policy directives and various OMD circulars. And then, of course, the leaders of our federal agencies all take actions that constitute policy as well. But we have to look at policy not in terms of speeches and oratory, but in terms of actual dollars and cents and directions that we're receiving. And the challenges that we face in advancing these kind of sciences into the applications phase over the next two years have to overcome different perceptions of priority. The greatest challenge of the space station is because we have such a phenomenal logical difference that it has applications in biology, chemistry, physics, and potentially in Earth and space sciences as well. You can't possibly pursue a portfolio across that entire spectrum. So you have to, because the funding would be uh, cost billions of dollars. So you have to be able to channel your efforts into the most rewarding and potential areas of investigation in order to demonstrate progress. There are also competing strategies for how you manage a portfolio. Uh, one way to manage a portfolio is to distribute it evenly across all comers. In that kind of a system, very little gets done in any individual area. However, if you try to select a couple of areas to narrow in on, you unfortunately alienate the areas that have not been selected. So it's a very difficult balance to maintain, and, and managing that portfolio is really critical to your success. There are also trade-offs between ideological <coughs> policies and, and true analytical studies. You know, are we trying to favor a particular community over another community uh, for an ideological purpose? Or do we have an analytical basis for saying that we're going to pursue cellular molecular studies versus higher animal studies? And these are the kind of trades that we have to balance every day. I don't need to talk about bureaucratic practice. We're all uh, inside the belt and we know uh, plenty about that. Uh, but perhaps one of NASA's greatest challenges because what we do is uh, it takes a great deal of time to build and deploy these facilities, to build the equipment to do the research. It takes multiple administrations. So we have to have programs that can sustain themselves across changing administrations and what can sometimes be changing policies. And that's the real key to success with a, a, a national asset like the space station being able to continually advance despite political changes that are occurring around you during the course of the years. Uh, so that's a, a short summary of where we, we are with the space station program. We have a, a decade ahead of us, uh, perhaps more, depending upon how the benefit cost turns out by the end of the decade. 
Uh, but there is no question that the opportunities are there, uh, provided the policy supports the pursuit of those opportunities. Thank you.